All right, welcome to the Gym Life Podcast, another exclusive interview for all of you out there. This is one that we've been waiting for for quite some time. Uh, this guy's reputation precedes him. Uh, not only is he a great strength programmer, great trainer, great athlete, he's also a great dude. Let me introduce you to Ben Pauley. Ben, thanks for being out with us here today. Oh, thank you guys for having me. I was real excited to come on. You know, I'm going to get right to it because this this is, uh, I remember when we first uh well, listen, you're, like I said, your name and reputation precedes you more than you think it does. You're a pretty humble guy. In the power circles, in the programming circles, everybody knows who Ben Pauly is. But when I was telling people I had you coming on the show, I'd hear crazy, intense, the dude's off his rocker. Well, yeah, I, get that you know, I mean, you've got a lot of these adjectives that precede you. <laughs> that makes sense. And then I see that one picture of you when you were younger and you had a skateboard in your hand with long hair. Yeah. How did you get from there to here? What do you think about when people talk about your reputation like that? I mean, how does that make you feel as, as I guess, from where you're at today? Well, it's a it's a humbling thing. Uh, you know, I was uh, kind of, well, I thought it was a curse when I was young, but it was, uh, it was more of a blessing type thing where uh, I was always surrounded by some pretty high level guys in the area that I chose to mess around in with, with whatever it be athletics or I, well, yeah, when skateboarding stuff like that is for like athletes, but um, it was, I was never, I was always kind of behind the curve, started a little bit later, I didn't progress as much, and then I always had this weird thing coming up across everything that I dabbled in where I would get real, real good, and then I'd be like, oh, shiny thing over here, and then I'd just kind of yeah. sidetrack and go to something different, and then a couple years go by, I look back, and then I would be like, I was, I was right there on the cusp of doing something good with this. And then I got out early and then keep going with that one thing, same thing happened over and over and over again. So um, hearing that type of stuff, very humbling for me, man. Yeah, because you are an intense guy. I mean, we see these pictures of you that we've been posting and you should hear some of the comments that we get on them, you know, <laughs> especially the one where you had the blood coming out of the forehead. Yeah, it looked like you, you started know. bleeding from yeah. your head. Well, so I, you know, it's this pre-squat squat ritual that I do when I'm real jacked up and uh, I don't know, my, I got a hard head, but usually I just headbutt the bar straight a couple times and then I'm good. You know, it just kind of helps me wake up a little bit. I guess I'm kind of a caveman in that regard. I got to get knocked in the head a couple times to get really on point. But, you know, it worked out perfectly for that photo op because I kind of missed the bar a little bit and it drug up my head. And then when I went to brace, I was like, man, I'm sweating my ass off. And it was, <laughs> I didn't even know I was bleeding. And then I didn't know until I got off the platform and I was like, I was on some crazy shit that day, and um, I had some guys talking shit to me uh, before the meet and all kinds of stuff. So I was, I was just, I was yelling at my training partners. I was like, "I told you, motherfuckers!" Blah, blah, blah. I started yelling, and I was spitting blood everywhere. And they're like, "Relax, relax, you're spitting blood." I'm like, "What?" And I'm like this, and blood all over my face. And then luckily, we got it patched up for the bench, so it didn't go. Behind. You know, that just added to the legend of, of Ben Pauly, I guess. Right? <laughs> That's that that picture kind of started it, maybe even a little bit more. Uh, yeah, we were wondering, like, Jesus, did he get such a pump that he broke a blood vessel in his forehead? No, I've never done, like, those, like, yeah. Larry Wheels things or whatever. He's, like, bleeding out, out of his chest. chest. Usually, yeah. usually I'll uh, I'll pop some blood vessels in my eyes. I had this really weird one where I was, I was going through a lot of food allergies for a while. And, like, the areas that my allergies would act up in, yeah. even though I wasn't having an allergy, I'd do a big squat or something, and I'd get these huge, like, blood patches yeah. all around, like, my hips. Like, I think it was where, like, your lymph nodes are. Yeah. And uh, so that was that. But that was the first time I ever had a nice big bleed. I still haven't had that like iconic like nose bleed. Yeah. Maybe you that's know? a good thing. Though, yeah. Right? Hopefully it's a good thing. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. But it's one of those yeah. kind of kind of look at it like I like that shit. So I'm like, Man, yeah, like no, I right up past it. Yo, thing. like it looks cool. Right. It Let's does, be real. Yeah. But it can't be healthy. <laughs> oh, I mean, I mean, when yeah. you start getting up there, there is. We, we've we've crossed that line years yeah, ago yeah, yeah, with, for sure. with being healthy. I tell People that come in, you know, to my place and they, they talk about, you know, what they want to do. And I'm like, if, if you want to, if you're a competitive minded person, and especially if they were a higher level athlete somewhere else, I'm like, if you want to start this, it's not, don't get into comp or competing to be healthy. It's not going to be healthy for you. You know, there's a certain line, you know, maybe the first three years, something like that, where you're building strength and everything and you can be, be really healthy. But then at a certain point, the body's just not to meant, not meant to push big, heavy weights. Yeah. And then to stay relatively healthy and do that, it's such a full-time job that they, it's just not practical for them. They can't, you can't do it with a normal nine to five and get up there um, 
But then again, we got some guys that have a normal nine to five and do it, so they're they're crazy. Yeah, yeah I those think guys. there's there's always the exception to the rule, right? Like, I mean, there's always people that can maybe, but <clears throat> like you said, at a, at a certain point, like we've get, we're getting to the point, and I say it every year, and then somebody goes and does something crazy, but we're getting to the point where we're getting close to reaching the limits of human capability. I think in some of these things, deadlift, you know, like you start talking thousand pounds and you know or five hundred kilogram deadlifts. Like that's a lot of weight for the human body to to pick up, and the spine is not, and it's just not. You we're not designed so. to do think that. We're reaching but, that limit, right? Then every year well, that's what I said. Every year. <laughs> well, I think I think what I get this all the time. You know, I get guys they'll message me some eighteen year old kid deadlifting eight hundred pounds and all this stuff, and they're kind of wondering what it's about, and what it really comes down to is the sharing of knowledge. You know, you got oh, yeah, these kids sure. that are. You know, let's say they're a sumo puller. They're starting out, and they know how to open their hips. They know how to pull their slack out. It took me four or five years. I used to yank, I yanked the bar off the floor until I pulled 680, I think it was, in a meet. And I had no idea about pulling slack. And, you know, there's mobility. There's recovery. There's training splits and all this stuff. And this was stuff that we had to figure out. I mean, there was, there was websites and content, but I just didn't know about it and stuff. And even when I first started when I was real young, way back in – the weight room in the middle school and high school days, I mean, they had like the old Dave Tate, like deep squatter, like uh, right. uh, page. Mm -hmm. And that was about it. And then they had like the West side videos and then maybe powerlifting USA, but it was like, that was a, it's a small community. So that's not really getting out there for strength training. So I think nowadays um, what's going to be really interesting about the, that human limit is going to be when we have these kids that are coming up, from you know high school powerlifting mm -hmm. or high school strongman mm -hmm. that have this technique dialed in yeah 10 12 20 years before the next guy that had that big world record and then they get to do that extra bit because yeah there's yeah. there's going to be tissue capacity and what can the spine handle and stuff but i i think it's going to be that next tier of knowledge and um and the longevity of these young guys is what's really going to push it in the future yeah, longevity, right? I mean, it, it's become more because of this knowledge that's available for this 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 leap in training and this leap in, in executing these lifts. But now I think it's really falling back more on maintenance and recovery. And I know you're really big with that. I mean, it, it doesn't just start and stop with a good training program. Yeah, and that's that's the biggest thing when you get into the pro elite, you know, territory stuff with that is, is this stuff is – crazy full-time job with me managing all these athletes and doing the stuff myself like stuff you know i gotta hammer the electrolytes and you know pump salt in and you gotta plan your meals out and then you gotta go in there and you gotta do your mobility and then all the stuff is basically going to be useless if you don't know what you're doing with it and you don't have a direction and everything like that and um it just becomes a very complex animal and then some of that is just like a time thing where like i said it's it's for these people to plan the meals out, eat them when they should, and wake up and go do that mobility when they would actually need it instead of just cramming it in whenever. Right. It's all this stuff that's going to uh, aid to that recovery aspect. And it's we're still learning this stuff now. Like at our gym, we have um, Coach B. Rose and Coach Nate, and they're getting into the FRC stuff, which kind of peeled its way off of the PT world. And this is helping with the mobility and the recovery exponentially. So we're adding all that stuff in and we're, we're trying to get guys, you know, more recovered. And then, you know, they have stuff just like deloads. I mean, when I right. started training, we didn't, no one even mentioned the word deload. Yeah, what was right. deload. Yeah. You know, some guys were doing a light week, but everybody was like, all right, you're banged up. So you're kind of going light because that's all you can handle that week. And then, you know, and then like, um, I just put in a couple of my posts, like implementing the RPE stuff, which man, I used to hate on it. I used to post about it and make fun of it. <laughs> and I was sitting there, I'm like, man, well, these motherfuckers aren't limping into the gym and everything and I, I can get it done but i'm going to turn 35 here i'm like i got to be a little bit smarter going into this tail end here if i want to do what i want to do so i started you know uh implementing that stuff and then training you had mentioned our, our, speaking of rpe for a minute you know we we actually bagged on that pretty good on a podcast once i think it's being it's an overused acronym i, I think people don't know how to use it properly so we we make fun of it yes. you, you like the two-man rpe you mentioned that when i was talking to you a couple weeks ago back in the gym yeah, yeah, my 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 friend uh, uh, Taylor Gone, um, real high level coach Ben Pollock's coach, and um, me and him chat online just about every day. Kind of like minded individuals, and he kind of I told him I was using it, and I just can't because I've been doing conjugate for so long. It's speed work, and then there's max, and so I had no idea it was like 
This is RP 777, can't move it. RP 15, I, uh, this is way too big of a jump. So he introduced me to that two man RP. They call it like a, some acronym. It's like Vespa. Not even close to that. Some of the beat. Some of the beat. Well, yeah, that, that kind of worked well because I could have a training partner help me regulate it and stuff. And um, the closer I'm getting to honing in on that, the better my training's going. But that's exactly like speaking to what you were saying is uh, a lot of these kids that are young, like they have no idea what reps in the tank are and stuff like this or like an RPE or reps in reserve reps and RPE and reverse, because yeah. – a lot of those guys don't even have the skill to strain under max weights for a long period of time. They don't know their fatigue level. Yeah, right. I've had some of these kids where we'll get them pissed off and they take a 90% for 10 reps. And I'm like, okay, well, you've never even really maxed out. Yeah, that's, so, the, that's part of the problem with RP we talked about was that like, especially the earlier you are in your training, you have no idea what your body's capable of. So there's like... I, I've always, I've always felt RPE was a little bit too subjective. I get it as a training tool. I get it, especially from the coaching side. I just find, I, I find it harder on the athlete side because, like, for me personally, I'll never have an RPE ten. An RPE ten means I'm not moving it. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. So, like, if my coach is like RPE nine and a half, I'm probably crumbling under that. <laughs> yeah, well, what, what is crazy with it is, um, it's so damn effective for these guys that are amazing at auto regulating. The guys that do have it fine tuned, um. You know, we got a guy at our gym, Rob. Um, he just squat a thousand pounds single ply, and the kid's a freak. He posts on social media once in a while. He's like, we call him the robot, and he's like a forklift. This kid hasn't missed. He's missed probably two lifts in the last yeah. three or four years, and monster PRs every time. And there's, you know, a bunch of kids that train. Um, they're like the USAPL uh, style guys. They train down F3 Fitness. A couple of them are scattered in college, but these kids are dialed in with the system, and they're insanely consistent and they make good linear progress every time so that's kind of what i was looking at. i'm like well there's something here because yeah, yeah. you know like even though i'm hating on it but um like we chatted about a little bit before i'm always kind of looking at the other side of how i'm thinking because i know there's something there because i'm such a hard-headed individual i get dialed into one thing and then i know that'll be my downfall in the long run so i'm like i got to start exploring this stuff because some of the ways, and this happens in like a conjugate system all the time, people pick a couple of pieces of it and they run it and they're like, oh my God, I hate this. So they run like the max effort and the speed, not understanding that the meat and bones is the GPP and the accessory and that that speed and max stuff is only 20% of the program. So all this stuff kind of combining in and then obviously you don't have a guy like Louie there explaining it to you. You can right. have all these guys that are practitioners, but you know, practitioners of a conjugate, but what we see with that is these guys just always mold and form fit it to what they're doing and how it works for them, which is kind of what I think, you know, Louis put that out there for with all this stuff is, you know, when he talks about, he's like, Hey, some guys use dumbbells for speed. Some guys do incline, some guys do flat, whatever. It's meant to form fit, but you know, you got to have the baseline knowledge to be able to implement it correctly first and then form fit it to everything that you need. So, um, that's kind of what, that um, kind of what I've been doing with all my athletes is just kind of fine tuning it. And um, it's a conjugated system, but we run a lot of, it's basic linear progression every single, every single workout, but it's just hilarious online. Cause everybody, you know, they see me training a conjugate style, which it's not even really conjugate, but they see a band on the bar, some chains, and then they think we're running a strict West side system. And then if they took that post out of their mind and then saw the rest of the training, it's all, linear block stuff and you know you said something interesting to me before a conversation a couple weeks ago and i really i really love this about you because a lot of guys with your knowledge and your time in the sport uh tend to get really kind of in their lane and stay in their lane uh, you're always challenging your thinking you're always cha like you said you, you you know you're a hard-headed guy and so you're always stopping for a minute okay hey if i wasn't that guy how would i be thinking about this mm -hmm. and you mentioned to me that you take about an hour and a half every day to learn something new and I, I think that was pretty cool when I heard that. I think you were there too, Robbie, when oh, yeah. you were talking about that. I thought, you know, that really is a testament to kind of how progressive you are with your thinking and your training because you've evolved. Well, thank we you. talk yeah. about that. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that? Like, well, so it was, uh, it was always kind of started out from, um, you know, the high school, middle school days was I was never a guy that could jump into something and kind of get it to click. I always had to dig way deeper than you could ever do it 
uh, or uh, more than most people would do uh, into their sport or whatever they were going into. And um, I'd have to figure out the exact inner workings and then make myself understand it instead of just blindly go and try to copy a guy. So that never really worked for me. So it was always like, all right, so as I got older, you know, I got into high school and college and stuff. And then they started talking about continuing education and everything like this. And then it was kind of, you know, through the college years of that, you have that like freedom to study up on your topic. And, you know, um, I did like four or five things throughout my college years. And then from drinking seven days a week, I went to school for like a decade. It was nuts. Yeah. But um, <laughs> I got to do a lot of that continuing education. And, you know, I was, I was a big, and am still a big reader and stuff like that. And I just, my brain is so scattered all the time with stuff that it helps me calm everything down. And then um, after a while, I figured out that it was so essential to me growing as a person, as an athlete, as a coach, that I kind of was like, all right, I need to put this like actually in my schedule right. and stuff. And then, you know, once I was fortunate enough to build up a good following and a good group of athletes and everything, my uh, I freed up my schedule and stuff. I kind of work four days a week now and then bunch of off time and stuff and I'm a huge I it started I was a bouncer years ago and my schedule kind of started to slowly flip and morph and then I started getting up earlier and earlier and going to bed early and so I'm up at 3 a.m. every day and then I get all kinds of stuff done I get my workout done programs done so I have all this time and then um you know I started kind of implementing that um and it's it's just like an hour and a half block that's kind of penciled in, and it goes over all the time or goes under. And sometimes. you hold yourself accountable to that. Like, but it's, but it's I got to do something with it every day. Yeah. You know, even if it's all right, I got no time. I'm feeling real lazy. Just you know, watch the start of a podcast, and then I'll segmentally work through that across a couple of days or whatever. But yeah, it's just it's always um, you know it it kind of just comes up by random. Obviously. Me being a strength coach, it's a lot of strength-based stuff. I get huge into trying to find what's going to be happening in the future. Like, I'm getting really into, like, I'm trying to figure out what I can pull out of, like, plow metrics and ice mm -hmm. and And um, the Russians used, I don't even want to word it, but they used all kinds of stuff where they would kind of eccentrically load the body and then um, with a short range of motion and then... Um, right away go to like a concentric movement and mm -hmm. their strength was flying up i i've been i've been researching on that and messing <clears throat> with that like in my deadlifts like pull a heavy one from the blocks set it down then uh, or pull a heavy one from the blocks pull the blocks out and then do a dead right. stop rep and kind of a way to overload you and get to that uh get you to that next weight a little bit sooner than you would and then like this morning we me and coach b rose and um coach brent um oz athletics at our uh our place at RPG, like we, we just were such nerds. We went an hour and a half tangent about talking about scapular depression in a bench and how do we fix these pec minor issues and overactive traps. And we're talking about articles. We're looking up stuff on Instagram. We came up with a bunch of new drills and shot some videos and everything that we're going to post up for everybody. And then it goes sports psychology, you know, um, I'm a huge history buff. I was going to be, uh, be a museum director for a long time and um, when I was real young and in school. And so I go down and um, read a lot of war history, a lot of um, medieval stuff, um, ancient politics, all kinds of crazy stuff. Mm -hmm. Medieval stuff. makes <laughs> complete sense with you. Yeah, I can see, yeah for sure. <laughs> so, you know, we're, we're, we really took a deep dive into kind of... It, it, it was it's a plethora of knowledge that you have that you're working with which i think is really cool and not unique to not unique to to, to a lot of people i should say unique to some not unique to all because i i get it that you know guys aren't going into it with the same type of methodology that you are trying to broaden your your base or yeah. broaden your knowledge in a, in a particular sport and again they stay in their lane but let's let's go back a little bit to uh well let's go back about 20 years really because i'm real curious and, and this is something i like to do on the podcast before all this lifting stuff, man, before, I mean, when you were going through grade school and, and you were kind of developing the character that you've become today, uh, which is a huge leap from what I saw that yep. picture until now, how did it all kind of start for you? Where, did, where were you back in those days? And because something got, something opened this door for you. But before that, who were, who were you? And then what kind of brought you to this door that you opened up now that is your world? Well, it's, I was, uh, I was real young. My my older sister was like hardcore punk rock scene down in Detroit, like spikes everywhere, big old mohawk, and so I grew up around those people as I started to 
develop into kind of like a young man and stuff. So I kind of always gravitated towards that world of like the the underground culture and like that hardcore punk rock scene and all that stuff. And my sister used to take us down to shows and everything. And and so that kind of led the way into the skateboarding for me. And, um, you know, again, I started out, I wasn't very good. And we had a, you know, we had an older group of guys in town that had been skating for years and everything. And we'd always go out there with them. And they just were as good as they were. And that was it. And they didn't understand, you know, if you practice at something, you'll get better. And so, you know, they would always, you know, they were a little bit more asshole-ish and they were like older degenerate type guys. And um, so we tried to skate with them and everything and they kind of just kept shunning us and everything like that. And so I don't know where it came from, just us in my family being stubborn males. And I was just like, all right, man, well, I got to be better than this guy just so I can show him that I can be better than him just because he's being an asshole to me. So it was kind of just put my nose down and I'd go and just skate for hours and hours. And, you know, I played... Growing up, I played every sport you can imagine. I was, uh, you know, soccer, baseball, everything, hockey, football, wrestling, everything. But um, my dad built me a um, like a half court in my back in my backyard because um, I he wanted me to be like a really badass point guard at a certain yeah. point in time. And um, I was huge in basketball, played a lot of Gus Mackers and all kinds of okay. stuff like that. But um, after I hit the skateboarding stuff, I just kind of was like, all right, I can use this to do all my, my flat ground tricks and everything. And so it started with the skateboarding. And then, um, you know, I played football up until eighth grade. And then um, the skateboarding, I, was, I started to get some momentum. I started to get real good. And then I linked up with a pair of guys, kind of a town over down in Elginac, Michigan. And they had some kids that were right at my same level. And we started a little skate group. So we'd take a little van down to Detroit and skate at Hart Plaza and stuff. And they had like a big skateboarding culture down there and everybody was cool. Started progressing with that. And then I was in this rebel phase, you know, like punk rock stuff, purple hair, everything like that. And wearing the Jinko jeans and the whole nine yards. And then uh, I started to gain muscle. I started hitting my growth spurt. Yeah. And everybody there haunting me like, you gotta go back to football. You gotta go back to football and everything. And then, you know, I could see my old man really wanted me to do it. So I'm like, all right, man, let's try this out. And then as with anything, I get a little, you know, I get a little taste of it. And then I'm like, I have to go and do this all the way now. So right when I was on the cusp of becoming, you know, a pretty good skateboarder, I jumped over back into the football. Um, it was the summer of junior year going into senior year. And so they gave me workouts and I do them twice. And then, you know, they give me, and so they give me my football workouts. I'd hit those and I go to the gym. I had um, one of a real good mentor of mine, lifetime mentors named Steve Sean Weber. He was an old power lifter, old uh, college football player, and he was the standard, like, parachute lightning pants, like, cut-off sweater yeah, guy. Nice. And he'd go in the gym, and, like, he was the regular, so they'd let him put on Judas Priest on the radio and just crank it. And so we started banging heavyweights with him, and, you know, I gained probably, like, 30 pounds or some crazy thing across, you know, junior to senior year. And then, so they threw my ass on the line, and then um, it worked out perfectly, actually, for me because, you know, we had amazing coaches and – I got some of our coaches uh, that I came up under, they were in the Hall of Fame and stuff, but like being that old lineman mindset of like, you know, you're back in the shadows and you're never going to get any credit for your work and you got to have that pride in the group of old right. linemen. You're not going to be in the paper for anything, right? So um, that worked out really well because it transferred over from the skateboarding days because we were this like underground sport at the time. This is like maybe a couple, three years before the Tony Hawk era when everything really started to blow yeah, up. Yeah. And so it transferred into that. And then um, I started building the weights, getting stronger and stronger and stronger. And then at the end of the year, you know, a couple of my coaches were like, hey, man, you know, you could go, you know, play some college ball. They're like, we don't know how high of a level, maybe D3, D2, whatever, but um, keep lifting. So I was like, all right. So we used to have this program. Um, it's called Dawn Patrol. And they'd let us in the building at like 6 a.m. Everybody play like hardcore dodgeball and end up in a fist fight every time with all the athletes <laughs> yes. and all the guys. Yeah. And uh, they let me in there, and I was like, I don't like dodgeball, and they just opened up the weight room for me. And so me and um, – I live by myself a lot, and they have – one of our coaches was on the old uh, uh, Illini teams that won the national championships, and he played – I believe he played defensive end on the Raiders for years with this big, giant motherfucker, dude. He's huge. He used to grip the barbell at the collars and just rep out 315 for about a minute straight and put it in, and he's like, I'm good, put it in the rack. But So I lifted under him, and uh, I went from about 180 – 75, 80, and I ended the summer going into camp um, for my first year 
uh, college ball at 240. Wow. And luckily enough, we have um, like an, a German and Italian family. So we have all these really high carb meals in the house. And so oh, yeah. I was eating like a savage. And I was reading up on some stuff, you know, I was getting into like the bodybuilding uh, dot com stuff and everything and started really researching it. And these guys were kind of hardcore. I started getting into the animal pack stuff. I started reading that and they're like, you got to eat till you puke and all this stuff. So I, that's what I did. And I just kept eating, wow. eating, eating, and got up to 240 and got way stronger and cut my uh, 40 time down and everything. And then. Um, in what position were you playing at the time? I was a um, offensive tackle in high school, and then I ended up playing. Um, I was Mike linebacker in a defensive end when I played. I was going to say I, 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 that's what I was picturing. Yeah. So. Yeah. So it was, um, and then like I said, like I always research and study everything. So I was a defensive end to start, and then um, I dive hardcore into well, because I I was relatively slow, you know, slow white guy. So that's just me, and um, so I knew that if I knew the plays better, I could sure. get a first step there, and. Um, so I studied, you know, the uh, offenses, and I studied the defenses, and I knew that stuff like the back of my hand, so that's when they moved me to Mike, because they're like, well, he knows all the positions, he knows all the roles. Played there, but it just wasn't the same as the hometown feel. We had, like, the Varsity Blues, Tight Knit. Yeah. Um, I'm from Marine City, Michigan, so it's like this hardcore. They were like, they've been in the playoffs every year for like 100 years, Division Five now, these before. But, uh, yeah, just... Uh, it really just kind of transferred into me getting huge. Um, well, not huge, but I thought pretty I was huge. huge. I thought yeah, I was yeah. huge. Yeah, yeah. No, um, that was pretty huge. Yeah, um, yeah across, across there, and um, I got good with that. And then I just I didn't have that feeling. You know, it wasn't like, you know, on a football field in high school, you can make a tackle and you can headbutt some of your friends, and then they're all giving yeah, you fist yeah. bumps and everything's cool like that. And um, it was my first time in my life where I realized, like, how college sports and, like, higher-level sports operate where – you know, I had made a good play. I made a tackle for loss at quarterback. And then I hop up and this kid, a uh, defensive lineman, was yelling at me because I stole his tackle. And then, you know, I was yeah. I was busting my ass and I don't know what the deal was. I had a, one of the linebacker coaches. Didn't really take a liking to me. Um, I have no idea why, but I came over to the sideline and then, um, you know, he's like, he's called me Pauly. He didn't know how to say my last name, but he's like, he's like, He's like, yeah, he's like, that's a pretty good stick, Polly, but you can have a lot more of those if you quit being a lazy ass in practice. And so I lost my shit and started fighting him and then yeah, basically got booted. And, well, I don't know if I got booted. I don't really remember too much, but all I remember was I was at Olivet, and it was about, I think, an hour away from Western. All my boys I played high school with, they had uh, went to Western. So I was like, hey, you know, let me come live with you guys. And he's like, yeah, one of my – my buddy Brett, he had his dorm mate left school, and they didn't fill his spot, so he just had an open dorm. So I just packed up, went over there. They let me in the side door, and I lived with them for the remainder of the year. And then that summer, we got an apartment. Yeah. And then um, I was there for a couple of years. You know, it kind of makes sense. You know, uh, you're tying together this story a little bit. It's all making sense to me now because you've been the same guy your whole life. I mean, this powerlifting didn't change you. You've just been changing powerlifting. Well, they yeah, <laughs> I'm trying, man. Well, you were that the, same intense guy. You were that guy that that took a look at something and like you're in your in your in college football in particular. When you're saying, "Listen, I wasn't the fastest guy, but I'm gonna learn this game better than everybody well, else." That was well. I mean, it was just a necessity thing. Yeah. You know, I just knew that. You know, we had some of these guys. We had uh, we'd have guys that got flunked out of Division One schools and all this stuff. And we had a guy that was already getting looked at by the NFL. He's playing D three, and this guy was running like. Some crazy four two forty or something. It was complete insanity. I've never seen an athlete move like this, and that was kind of what got the ball rolling because I was there and um I was going for physical education, and I started to kind of see we had and then we had one guy his name was Mac, and he was like thirty eight years old but he had went back to school back in the eighties our fullback and he benched two twenty five for like fifty some reps it's like a world record or something I don't even know I was watching so I was in complete amazement, and then I started to kind of get um, a little taste of the science side of the physical education. And I was like, I like this more. And we had a pretty progressive strength and conditioning coach at Olivet at the time. And then he's like, I'm like, what can I do with like science and the lifting? And then he kind of pointed me um, towards the exercise science realm and stuff like that. And um, that was a very good base for what I would end up going on to do, you know? Yeah. Um, you, you, so there was a little break there, though. I'm guessing when you when you moved over to Western and you kind of had time of your life there i'm sure this oh is god yeah well it was fun stories to be told it was there. it was it yeah. was just it was a group of yeah you know i i graduated when i was 17 so i was 
eight, 19 at the time. All of us were under 21, and it was all a group of like really tight knit. There was like 10 of us, high school kids, and we were just unsupervised, and there were, were all a bunch of hillbilly kids, and it yeah. was just it was just bad bad news. And then um, stayed there for some years, and we just kept partying and doing terrible terrible stuff. And I had a buddy of mine, and you know at the, at the time I was living with him, he's like he he had a little trust fund, so he got his house for free. So he's like, come stay on my couch or take a room, whatever the hell you got to do, and. We were kind of looking at each other after a party one day, and I'm like, we're wasting our life, man. we got to get the hell out of here. Mm -hmm. I'm like, we're not even going to school or doing anything. Were you lifting at all at that time? Well, so me and him actually had went to this badass bodybuilding gym called SWAT. It was Southwestern Athletic Training or something like that. But they had a bunch of real badass bodybuilders, and um, he was doing all the things that bodybuilders do and everything like that, getting real huge and doing the diet just because he wanted to look good to pick up girls or whatever the hell he was doing. He wasn't competing or anything, but he was getting, he was getting strong. So me and him got a membership there and we were going in there and started to get the taste for the heavier weights. And I didn't really like it at the time. And basically across this whole thing, I was, um, you know, I grew up kickboxing and in boxing since I was real, real small. And um, they had a guy in my hometown that opened up an MMA gym and I was a hothead when I was young, coming up in the rebellious days, and I kept fighting too much. My old man was basically like, hey, you can go to this gym or you're out of the house. And so I joined that. And so kind of the whole time, I'd always be bouncing back on every time I'd go back home for the weekend. And he had the gym right in my hometown, so I'd stop in there. And then that rolled into kind of what would be my MMA career. The next you chapter. could call it that or whatever. Yeah, but yeah, right. so we were at Western. Me and my buddy had agreed. We're like, we know all of our friends that I used to skateboard with went to Central, and they partied their ass off, but they would get their shit done. And so, you know, I was like, this is, we can have our fun, but we need to get some stuff done here. So we moved out with them, and then um, um, at the time, I had flunked out of community college probably two or three times. So when you do that, they take away your loans. So you got to pay for some, yeah. you know, you got to pay for your credits uh, out of pocket. So I had some money left over um, from what I had saved up previous. And so... I've always been a manual labor guy, you know, um, I work construction and roofs everywhere I went. So kind of hit me one day. I was like, all right, man, you're kind of wasting your life party and doing all this dumb shit. And so I said, how many hours am I putting in on a roof a day? You know, I was working eight to 12, sometimes like crazy 16 or whatever. And I'm like, just do four hours in the books. You know, when I got to central, this is when I was trying to change everything up and, um, I kind of changed my mindset with it, paid my way into the community college there and sat down for four hours with the books. And then once you know, it straight A's across the board. And then that got me into central. And then after that, once I kind of found and honed in on um, the exercise science stuff, and it was so interesting to me and I was already trying to kind of implement the uh, strength and conditioning stuff with the guys that were fighting that I was training with and um just getting really into that it was just a really easy route for me because the school was never school how most people think of it it was me learning the thing that i've always wanted to do so when i would go home wasn't really studying it was like the same stuff i do now when i'm doing my reading and stuff but i would do that with assignments that i had to have so you know i, I would test out of classes and and um you know i would sit down and chat with a lot of the professors and stuff and you know they um they treated me very well and um I had a lot of good relationships there, so that was kind of a, a big turning point. That was kind of what solidified that you have to have the science end of stuff before you go straight brute on the training, and then kind of you have to be able to put it all together. Yeah, you, you actually took I, a path. That's Go ahead, Robert. No, I was just going to say I think that's super important and super enlightening because powerlifters, especially guys your size, not me, but you, you and Joe, you know, people tend to we i think joe and i were talking about this after another interview we did people tend to look at you guys as <laughs> these big meathead bang heavy weights disregard for my body and safety and because that's what they see yeah. right and so i think it's super super enlightening from a guy like you who obviously squats you know a thousand pounds and um that there's a science behind it you understand the science behind it you're following the science behind it yep. yeah it looks fucking crazy when i bash my head against the bar but believe me there's a fucking purpose for it you know yeah yep. and, and i think that's super important the other thing i wanted to point out is um has anybody ever told you you have an addictive personality you're really uh, thinking about uh, that. You're really well, thinking I got, about that. Well, I got a buddy that, uh, <laughs> my buddy Blake always tells me, he's like, man, you know, 
you're, you're not even trying to be funny, but just the way you say things makes me laugh. And that's about as close to it as some of the, some of the stuff, you know, when I, I get, I get my real close friends and I'm kind of like a hard out type guy. So I just go off the deep end with yeah. stuff that you shouldn't go off the deep end about. And I'm way too passionate about stuff that you shouldn't. I just deep. think that like, I just think that like it, you and I are very similar in that. Like once we grasp something, my wife will tell you like, I, I decided I was going to be a professional bowler and I go a hundred and 20 fucking percent into bowling. I learned everything about it. I learned literally how the balls were made, the pins were made. So yep. I can know every possible outcome of every possible thing I could do. Um, yeah, maybe addictive is the wrong word. No, maybe it's addictive. It's, yeah. And what, what I mean by that is once you grab, once you grab a hold of something, you grab a hold of that fucking thing until the next thing comes along. You know, well, I, but get, like, I get, you know, I get, I had this group, you know, guys that I trained with for years. Um, in the MMA scene and everything, and that we just went to college with. I was a I was a security guard, bouncer guy at uh, the Wayside up there at Central. It was a oh, yeah. nightmare, but all of us became really good friends and everything. And they'll tell you the same thing. The listeners tell you they're like this guy's a huge asshole, but they love <laughs> me. So maybe it's addictive in that way. But they'll just. <laughs> We'll, we'll be, you know, we'll be way too many beers deep when I start dadding them and stuff. I'm like, this is what you got to do, man. Like, this is where you're messing up. And I'm like, this is where the hole in your game is. And they're like, dude, we're at the bar, man. Relax. Bro, calm down. And I'm like, there's no time. Man. And I start getting way too. So when people say they don't like me, I'm like, I get it. I wouldn't like me either. But that's just what I is. think that's a, an, a, a term of endearment with you, Ben. I really do believe that because your intensity, you just said it, man. I could, I could picture those moments of you at the bar at the wayside there. That, that's great. That's great. I think what what I'm really getting from your your storyline is is that you've got all these different th these different processes that you've dealt with through a lot of different athletics, right? You, the football process and how to become bigger, faster, stronger, and more athletic. You were learning that process through exercise physiology and through mm -hmm. your training with the guys you were at the gym when football, and then with MMA, you were kind of learning how to dissect that a little bit differently and how to be more of a you know more of an athletic type of more of a, a, a I guess, you know, dealing with more oxygen and dealing with being able to be physical for longer periods of time. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, you know, you're transitioning back and you're using those, those, those things that you learn kind of, as I see them now as a part of kind of where you're at today. When did you decide powerlifting was the road for you? When did that sort of come into play for you? Well, so we were, we had a pretty badass elite group of guys that we trained with up there. We had a couple of facilities that ended up going under for the MMA stuff. We had one that was real badass, like full cage. We had, I don't even know, the square footage, huge, big old space of mat. Um, and then we had like a gym there. It was like a UFC training facility. And then the guy that was running it for us was an older gentleman that was in MMA, you know, when it started in Michigan. And he ended up having some problems with drugs and stuff like that. So he took the money and just did whatever. So we shut that down. And so... We had all of us uh, that were actively competing and everything at the time. So we we kind of tried to find a loophole. So we talked to the RSO, the Registered Student or Organizations at Central Michigan, and they had the wrestling room. And so we figured out if we called it a grappling club, you know, per the little constitution right. they make mm -hmm. you have, that we could train our MMA in there. And it was the wrestling room, so they got everything's closed off, and there's, like, windows up top. It's, mad it's in the basement. It's all matted, but then there's, like, two little holes. So we were just fighting there all the time, and then we would um, – Luckily, just nobody ever walked by to see what we were doing because they didn't care because we were in there after the wrestling practice and stuff. So they, um, we ended up having, you know, there's five or six or seven of these guys that were Bellator level guys. Wow. They're, you know, some of the guys, uh, one of my main training partners was just on ESPN plus on some fight. We have guys that corner all the guys in the UFC. One of my buddies, um, that ended up being, um, after a while I ended up taking over as the head coach kind of thing. And then he was, my buddy Shay was like the jiu-jitsu and wrestling coach. And um, we kind of ran it like that. Um, shit, I forgot where I was at. With the training, it leading into powerlifting. Yes, 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 no, I was trying to figure out where, okay. Yeah, so um, <laughs> these guys started kind of going, um, like they were thinking about higher level pro stuff. And, you know, I, I had a really nasty injury way back when I was 11 years old. A buddy of mine was coming home from school, and he put a dead bird in my coat. And then so we got home, and then I went to take my coat off, slipped my hand in my pocket, it was a fucking dead bird. And I was like, what the hell? So me and him got in a pretty good wrestling match. I threw him out of my house. And then he was knocking on my front glass door. Glass broke. Went in my eye, popped the retina off my right eye, and I had to go have surgery. So cut to 
the MMA thing, all these guys were kind of looking at possibly going pro and everything. So I was due for an eye checkup. They used to bring me in every like four years just to kind of scope it out, see how the surgery's holding up. And I was talking to the guy, I'm like, yeah, you know, a lot of my guys and buddies are going to this high level. Is that ever going to be in the cards for me? He's like, buddy, you're not supposed to have any repetitive head trauma oh, since you were you'll go blind. 12, you mm -hmm. know, because that retina can pop back off or whatever. Yeah. So I was like, I put the kibosh on that and then I transferred into more coaching. So as we got going, we started going out more and drinking more and partying more and stuff. So we spent less time doing the MMA stuff. So... Um, I had a buddy, uh, Ron Schock, that was up there. He was uh, yep. um, a bouncer with me, and he's like, hey, come try, you know, come try the strongman stuff. And I went out there, we went out to Jason Pyle's place, and uh, he had all of his stuff that came from what was JP's gym. Put it at his um, parents' house, his dad's house. So I went out there and trained with him. Ron was a big West Side guy, and um, he started training me, and... Um, well, we can come back to this part so I can get to the point of the story. But um, he started training me, and then we we trained up. I injured out of a bunch of meets, like I had told you with our last conversation. But then that first meet, I did it in like a tiny little uh, gym in St. John's, Michigan. And I was always looking for that adrenaline match of what it feels like when they lock the cage behind you, when there's another dude over there trying right. to rip your head off. Sure. And for whatever reason, that gave it to me. So that was kind of how – so I, I did my first squat in competition. I think it was like – 385, full knee wraps at 220. Humble beginnings. Oh, yeah. Oh, so yeah. you started like everyone else. Oh, just, just like, I tell everybody that's, I'm like, they, they come in, they're like, well, you know. Genetics, you didn't come out the womb squatting like, 600? Like, I don't want to hear this. I don't care. <laughs> and so, yeah, but, um, and there was nobody there. It wasn't a lot. There was like four people in the crowd. Then there's eight or nine total lifters. And it gave me that adrenaline. And I was like, Kind of what happened with the football was kind of like a spin off of that story I told you when the guy was yelling at me when I when I hit the quarterback sack and I just always felt that there was something even going back to the MMA days I feel like I didn't have the guys to train around me after a certain while because some of the kids started graduating and everything like that we didn't have a good enough crew to be able to get that good practice look mm -hmm. that's going to bring you up to that next that level. Next level. Yep. And so I was in same thing for football. Like when we would run our defense, you know, the defensive line were supposed to be on block destruct and I could roam free as a linebacker in the weeds and then make a tackle. And they would just swim a tackle or a guard and they'd be in the backfield and then I'd have a bunch of six foot eight linemen blocking me. I couldn't do anything. And it really annoyed me. So I was like, all right, this powerlifting thing I can control. Right. And you know, um, you know, through my studies at CMU and then talking with Ron Schock and talking with, um, you know, the guys like uh, like Jason Piles and all these guys that were real strong at the time, you know, I realized that I can use that science and that was my, that was my main strength. I can use that analytical ability to make myself good at that. And then kind of to the point of what I said before is I was kind of always blessed with these guys that were really high level in what they did with whatever I was trying to pursue. So, you know, like in the in the strength training, Ron was, I believe he was like top 25 strongest man or men in the nation at that point. You know, when he was, uh, he knew all the guys in the game and this was like probably maybe right around the time that the uh, cube method for strong man from Thick Pen came out. So there's all this real good knowledge floating around. And I was like, this is, this is right in my wheelhouse. But I understood from my days in martial arts, kind of with like jujitsu stuff, like these guys go in and, you know, it's going to be 10, 15 years to get your black belt. And all that stuff was always easy for me. If I find something that I like, I can just do it every day. Like, like you wake up and like yep. you go to bed. It's easy for me. So right. I knew. And then, and then, you know, at the time, this is when Elite FTS came up and Louis started releasing all kinds of stuff. And every one of them said, hey, anyone can do this if you just put in the 15, 10, 15 years. And I'm like, well, I like it. And it's everybody was listening to heavy metal. Everybody's banging their head against weights. It kind of spoke to that old punk rock kind of style that yeah. I used to like. Yeah. And you know, I had uh, kind of put that side of myself on the back burner, and that was something that was really weighing on me psychologically at the time, too. So it kind of just filled this huge void with a bunch of stuff I didn't even know I was missing. Yeah. And then I just fell in love with it. I was like, I can't get enough of this. And then it was like two, three-a-day workouts, just going in there, going nuts. And then being out there at Jason Pyle's place, these guys are behemoths. I think he was 6'8". Big Ron was, you know, six foot, six two, three hundred and eighty 380 pounds or whatever. The lightest sandbag was 300. I think the bear farmers was like 200 and some odd pounds. Log was 170. 
So I just like monkey fucked all these implements around for like six or eight months. And then I'm like, finally started to make progress. He got me on a program and it shot my deadlift up out of nowhere. So that's how I figured out I was a good deadlifter. So I had went and, you know, we were training for Motor City Strongest Man in like, I don't even want to say 2009 or something. I can't even remember because it's so jumbled up. But trained for that. I was going for a heavy rack pull, pulled one. And then, you know, I got all jacked. I'm like, I'm going to go for two. Blew my back out. And then um, this was kind of the prelude to what really set off like the, got, you got to dive in the books and learn this inside and out. Blew my back out. They wanted to do surgery. They said I had a fused disc. They said my SI joint looked like I had been in a car accident the whole nine yards. This doc, he was Cairo. He, he was having me go in there two, three times a week, taking all my money when I was a poor college kid. Never got any better, never did anything. And so finally I started talking around. I'm like, what's this, you know, like where are you getting your knowledge from, whatever? He introduced me to the Louis stuff. And then uh, Louis started talking about all of his back injuries and, you know, the reverse yeah. hyper and everything like that. And like, talking about how you gotta get stronger and everything. So we didn't have a reverse hyper, I had a regular hyper extension. Um, I had such bad sciatica down the left side, my left leg atrophied. And I was kind of sliding it. This really weird, like circus freak walk for a long time. <laughs> and um, they thought that that was just how I walked so around, would always make fun of me with this kind of weird, like limp. I kind of still walk like that, I guess. I think it's just in pattern, but um, um, yeah, I started, I started out and it was excruciating pain. I would do four sets 20 on a body weight hyper extension. And then I learned how to stretch my hip flexors and everything like that. And I built that up to where I was doing, you know, 405 on a barbell for four by twenties on a hyper extension. And as I progressed through that, my back got better and better and better. And then, um, I kept having accruing these injuries because the training from them was so advanced Yeah, and I was already, you know, I was already athletic at the time. So I was like picking up on it really well and I could move my body, you know, and stuff. So I kept just making progress, getting an injury, making progress, getting an injury, all that stuff. I think I mentioned to you, I injured myself out of my first three powerlifting meets. I did one where I was so scared. They had one, um, I think the guy's name was like Joe Schallinger bench, bench meets. It was at the YMCA mm -hmm. in Flint. Yeah. I, I actually, I know exactly what you're talking and about. And it's not even, it wasn't even sanctioned. Yeah. And I drove all the way there. I got so scared. I left. I was in the parking lot. I didn't go in the building. I was like, See, well, we might have met for the first time. Then. I was like, I was like, yeah, nobody even knows me, yeah. so fuck it, I'll just leave. Hmm. So I left, and then, um, yeah, years down the road, it was right as my group of friends all started graduating um, because of partying, switching the majors. I was a little behind the curve with all that. So yeah, I was actually, I believe I was either at Central or I, I was uh, one year out of Central when I did my first meet in St. John's, Michigan. It was called the Wolverine Open, not the one at Crocs Gym that. Right, you right. know, I just did, but it was yeah. the Wolverine Open there. I think it was Iron Horse Gym. It's it pretty is. badass little Iron place. Horse. Yep, that's right. But they had it was just badass. I remember walking in there. This guy had fucking ten foot wide lats, and then his wife had these traps ten times bigger than mine. I'm like, these are my people, man. <laughs> I'm, I'm mad at. I like this, <laughs> and they had this sketchy little mono, and they just had this old man trying to spot you by your armpits, and no side spotters. I don't believe, and like I told fourteen hundred in knee wraps. Yeah. And then I was like, what were you competing at your body weight at that time? That yeah. was, uh, I was like 215, but okay. in the two. So you dropped a bit of weight from football and all that stuff because you were getting into Yeah, well, injuries. so when I, when I did the, endur so I got back down when I was, uh, I used to, uh, what was it? Um, last one I did, 23 years old, I fought at 186. Oh, wow. You really came down. Yeah, so. Yeah. Kind of back down to that original sort of lifting weight in high school gym. Yeah, yeah, but it was just it was just gross. I was looking at myself all skinny <laughs> fat. I'm like, oh man. And I just kept looking in the mirror. I'm like, I'm so underdeveloped, you know. And then I'm reading up on these uh, Louis articles and like, just got to have these hamstrings hanging down. Yeah. I'm like, man, I gotta get those fucking hamstrings. Dude, that's what happened to me. I got because I I started out my fitness journey fat. I almost died, and and then I was like, so I was so focused on losing weight, you know. I got down to like 172. And I looked in the mirror, I was like, God, dude, I'm fucking tiny. You know, I'm still not big, but I was like, is that, it was that, that moment I was like, all right, we got to put on weight. Like, it's no longer about losing weight, you know? Yeah, I, that's, uh, I think that we, we've got the sig sickness, right? The bigophobia. Or whatever, Bro, I'll never be big. I'll never be well, big. Never, right? Don't say never, right? <laughs> so you had all these injuries early on you were talking about. Mm -hmm. Looking back on a lot of those injuries now, uh, preventative you look at that now and go fuck if i'd have done this or oh very very easily just not even yeah. know 
It was my motor. Is what was right, that's me. what I'm getting at. Yeah. So you yeah. look back now and go, okay, I could have fixed these. Problems. I've always been. Well, you said it when you were doing my little uh, my little pump up intro. You're like, <laughs> you know, it's that any given Saturday. That was me there because I was like, you know, I know all this stuff, and then I would, uh, you know, I was listening to a podcast with Chris Duff when he was talking about one time when he tweaked his back in the warm ups, and then he figured out how to brace correctly. And he figured out that he had to get, he, he said, I think it was like something like, he said, I'm going to get so upright in my setup that I don't have to use my low back. I could just uh-huh. stand up with it. And he went from like 675 to 800 or something in one meet. Like no, just taking it right off his And spine. so for me, I was always kind of chasing that. Like, hey, it's going to be that one Sunday or, or sorry, that one Saturday that you can go from a nobody and jump into like these, like at the time, like trying to qualify for the Arnold or whatever, elite totals or whatever the heck, or just like chase like a, a state record and all that stuff like that. So when was it? When was that one Saturday? Do you remember what meet that was when, when you got off the platform or the day was done and you kind of had that feeling, okay, I've arrived, I've, I've got here? It was still, I, yeah, I remember. It was still a real low-level thing, but I had, I had, after that first meet, I had tweaked my back squatting and me not knowing what I know now, I assumed that squatting was what was messing my back up. So I went push pole for a couple years. And then um, I met a guy, old Detroit barbell guy, trains at Strain Depot. His name is uh, Rob Fuzzarelli. And, um, you know, he was kind of, he's like a Zen guy. And he's like, he's like you know, 70? No, oh, no, no. He's no, he's, I think he's only 50. Oh. But he's, he's one of these guys like, hey, and he's an animal too, but he's like, hey, man, you got to be able to control this thing and put it where it needs to be. And so we rehabbed and everything and we got out um, on the platform at um, a DBB meet. And, you know, I had only squatted 475 in training, maybe five or six months before. And then I figured out how to squat, figured out how to brace through researching and everything. And then I ended up squatting 622 at that meet. I had like a 402 bench, I think. No, actually, no, that was probably a 391 bench. And I had pulled 650. And then, so it brought me, I was way behind the curve, and then, boom, I was right there in the, Where you needed to be. In the top yeah. heap of the guys right. in the state. Yeah. And then I was like, oh, well, that was just one kind of even a half a cycle of me figuring this out. So that was when I knew I'm like, all right, you know, you can really do something here. And, um, and then, of course, that... Same old shit that I always do is I'm like, all right, man, you should really have some here, but you're pretty strong. Why don't we dabble back in strong, man? And so then <laughs> it was, hey, you remember when you injured yourself out of Motor City? And then, you know, all my old training partners, Jimmy Mitchell and Ron and all those guys, once I started to make some progress, were like, come back to strong, man, do it, come back to strong, man. And then me and Jimmy Mitchell started chirping each other and I'm like, all right, motherfucker, I'm coming to get you. And so then that set off, um, Starting Strongman, and then it was, I don't even know, 16 or 17, something like that. Motor City Strongest Man. Went in, and my training numbers were complete insanity from my first uh, Strongman cycle because I put my spin on what is yeah. the way that I use my, or I, I train my athletes now. I kind of had the baby of that system in place, and so I made very, very good progress relative to what I see a lot of the guys, or what the, a lot of the guys were making then. So I went up. I think I won the first three events. Uh, or no, it wouldn't have made sense. It would have been first two events, whatever. Go to the Farmers. Farmers was my best one. You know, I had held uh, 350 a hand for a minute and a half in training. And this was 220. I was like, this is this is a pretty good event for me. Yeah. And then Shane Rickman <laughs> builds these goddamn Apollo Farmers <laughs> handles with powder coating on them. <laughs> And so I go to pick them up. I'm like, what the fuck? You couldn't even feel it. They were slipping out of my hands and everything. And I can't make an excuse, though, because there's a couple guys there that held them for like a minute. But picked them up on the third event, slipped right out of my hand. Yeah. Basically zeroed it. And then um, I think me and Jimmy tied on the fourth event. And then we were going into the last one. It was a deadlift medley. And I didn't know that down calls only meant touch and go. And so I had these like versa grips. And I kept having to, I'd pop my last deadlift and I had done this deadlift probably, it was, you know, whatever, regular deadlift, frame deadlift, and then an axle deadlift to finish out the minute. Right. And I had strapped in and done this thing for like 25 reps at the end of the minute. I was like, this is easily my event. I'm going to win this. Went in and I kept banging it on the floor and have to reset. Banging it on the floor, have to reset. And I got like 20 reps 
And then Jimmy came out, fucking beat me by one rep. I got second place. And then after that, it just drove me into a dark hole. So, <laughs> that was, you know, so from that day on, I went one whole year of just crazy maniac strongman training to uh, come back the next year at the motorcycle. You know, I was just down at Strength Depot. I'm pretty sure Shane has those Apollo farmer handles hung up on the wall, and it says Ben Polly drop right, these. Right. <laughs> my, 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 I, I put them in that dark hole. <laughs> my strongman guys are going to laugh when they hear this because they hear this all the time. If they start getting me going about the early days of strongman, they're like, oh my God, because I'm like the old man, I'll just repeat the story even though I've heard it a million times. And they're like, oh yeah, we already know the story, you dropped the It was powder coated. So I was, I'm always, you know, because like, we could go on and talk and shit and I'm like, I'm like, I'll come out of retirement and beat your ass right now and all these, all this stuff. And then I always tell them that same story, so. Oh, yeah, well, listen, those old strongman stories, I, 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 I drive Robbie crazy, I'm doing the same thing all the time. Um, so you, you decide after that next strongman in Motor City, uh, you start getting more powerlifting. That's still a, a pretty integral part of your training, despite the strongman, because I know you've integrated them now. Uh, yeah, very... I, I, I always had them in just because I had saw, in my eyes, I had the benefit of developing the posterior chain with the west side system as a huge benefit to the anterior chain loading of all the stuff on and strongman is all in front of you. So I always kind of had it in. Did that um, next Motor City, killed them all, and... Um, then it was time to go to USS Nationals. And um, training for that, tweaked my back. And um, so I pulled out of that, and I think it was probably three or four weeks later. I was, I was, I'm like a psycho with the competitors, so they release a list, and I start getting blood types and mother's maiden names and all kinds of stuff about all these guys. I know every number, I know everything. I'm the same way. <laughs> and so I, I, I knew everybody's numbers. I had my numbers set for Nationals. I researched every different year and everything like this and i had my numbers where i was going to kill everybody and then i was like well you know you never know on competition day pulled out they had uss nationals and the guy that won it i would have just completely killed him yeah i mean it's not saying much you got to be able to do it on show day but right, 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 right. i knew i was strong enough to do it so i was like all right well i can't jump and do another strongman show whatever so um you know let's jump back into the powerlifting. so um i jumped back into powerlifting, and from that strongman training I think I had 175 pound PR total, which actually I think I believe that ended up being relentless. Mm -hmm. So I reached out to JJ, I think it was Thomas, and I asked him if I could be in relentless because I always saw those as like some pretty hardcore badass meets. And I got in there, and I think I went from like I don't even know, I was 15 something, jumped up to 1627, got my first Arnold qualifier for like whatever the amateur day. Mm -hmm whatever, it's like pro versus elite or whatever. Mm -hmm. I don't even know the difference. But, um, yeah, so I, I was doing that. And then um, after that, a couple more strongman shows. And then um, uh, Steve Stucher, that owns my gym, he started getting into the gear. And I had always squatted real, real wide. Yeah, so real quick, let's be clear that your total about 16, 16, that was raw. a raw total? Raw with that was, Yeah, that was raw. Yeah, okay, was yeah I just want to make that point, everybody listening, because now as this story evolves, you start getting more geared. Yeah, that was, that was wraps at 220. That was infuriating, too, because we were, you know, I had uh, pulled 700, and then I had benched 425, and, um, well, that was that story I told you. That was the meat. And I had I had um, squatted 685. That was that meet I told you where it's charity meet, you know. So, oh, yeah. and oh god, I'm gonna I'm gonna piss off JJ yeah. by saying this, but they had all the DBB people there, and they had one of their 198 lifters, and he went way past the one minute clock, and you know he was supposed to have a big meet, so they let him slide and everything, and you know um, we're warming up. They end up calling my name from the back. It was in the church, you know, so it wasn't very good sound system and. Well, I, I think we were just banging weights around, so I couldn't hear, whatever. But I had only wrapped one knee, went out, got DQ'd, so I started arguing with the scores table. I think I believe it was actually Tina from Strength Depot, and I didn't know it at the time because, you know, I didn't know anybody. But I'm like, this is a charity meet. I'm like, can you just throw me in at the end of the flight and let me get my opener in? And they're like, no, 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 and I had only squatted. It was actually, my meet PR was like 622, I think, from that one meet, and then, you know, I'd only squatted, I think, 685, so like a high box just to feel it. Um I was like, and I'm looking around, and the guys can see I'm starting to go crazy. And I'm like, fuck, I put 700 on there. And they're like, really? And I, at this point, I had taken my last warm up at 585 an hour before this. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, fucking load it up. And like, I just, 
I do great. Uh, this, I, I, it's bad for health, but like I do so much better when I'm really angry. But <laughs> I got really angry, so I went back and I grabbed my guy that was wrapping by the back of the neck, and it's kind of this pose I get, and it's like an at attention pose. Like my guys know that when I when I grab you by the neck, it's, I'm going to tell you something serious or it's something I'm going to go nuts about. Grandma, I'm like, you put the tightest fucking knee wrap that you've ever put on a human being on this knee. I'm squatting this shit because these people just piss me off. I, and so they called me and um, it was kind of like this little like famous squat in our group because it was such a long grinder. So I went out, unracked the bar, hit the hole with 700, and I came up halfway and just stopped for maybe a legitimate four or five count. Felt like five minutes in my mm-hmm. head. Yeah, right. And then all of a sudden, broke through the sticking point, go, smoked yeah. it, and everybody went nuts. And I was like wow. freaking out. And then you're supposed to, it's, it, you know, it's, I felt bad because it's like, you know, it's like a kid's cancer thing and stuff. So everybody usually like goes out and they're shaking hands with the kids and give them high fives. And that's what you're supposed to do. And I was so pissed off. I just like walked out in front of the mono. I'm like, whoa, fuck you, motherfucker. I'm fucking losing my shit. And I looked at the score table. I'm like, what's up now? It's making complete sense. Why and now we, now we and, then, yeah. and then I walked to the back and then, yeah, and then went to the bench. They didn't anchor the bench into the floor. So it was going to be my first 400 competition bench. And I went to drive my legs. The bench slid. So I started yelling at them for the bench sliding. And then um, well, the total came up and it was like, all right, I needed a six. Well, that would put me at, what was that, 15... 100. I needed a 627 to qualify for the Arnold whatever amateur day. Um, so one of my buddies, Andrew, he's like, put 627 on the bar. And then um, pulled 627, smoked it, jacked my hip up at the top of the rep, and then jumped to seven, smoked it off the floor, couldn't lock it out. So yeah, I left that in the tank. That one always haunted me. Well, and sometimes you leave something in the tank, it's kind of nice going to the next show, you know where you're already at. So It just drives me yeah. into this like deep corner of my mind, turning me into a madman. I like this part. Yeah, Robbie yeah, it's the, it's, it's the mystery. Where I <laughs> open up the conversation about, hey, Ben, you know, your reputation kind of precedes you, and he's like real humble. I don't know yeah, why. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess there it is. <laughs> it makes complete sense to us right now. I love it. But so, to, go, to go back to what I was saying with, like, with Steve, so he jumped into the gear, and you know, all those Detroit barbell guys were in the gear, and I never really put the gear stuff together. I had tried a squat suit, you know, at Central. They had a couple of guys that were, uh, you know, they're strong men, so they had deadlift suits and stuff. But those DVB guys always had that kind of hardcore vibe yeah. that I really liked. Did you ever train with them in that warehouse there, that that storage facility there? Oh, had? no, that what? that whatever. That's like a, I don't even know. That's It was just terrifying in there. Oh, my yeah, God. I, one time I went there, it was pretty crazy. I, as a matter of fact, I was remember waiting in the parking lot. It's a storage facility. It looks like we're somewhere where people go to die. Yeah, yeah, yeah where, where you hide bodies and shit. Yeah, yeah. They open the door and there it was. But anyhow, go ahead. Oh, yeah. So though that was kind of like that vibe of kind of what I was into and how I thought that, you know, powerlifting, you know, was kind of, that was it, yeah. you know. And so they had, you know, they had um, Clay. They had, you know, um, Dean was out there. I think Mike Rich was out there. Rob Fooch, uh, Tim Hensley, uh, JJ, hmm. and a whole host of guys that I probably even never knew. But, um so I kind of, Steve got into the gear and I was thinking, I was like, well, that was hardcore. That was badass. And then at this time, this was kind of, it was a crossroads in like what I thought powerlifting was supposed to be. Yeah. And it started to get into the social media and like all these guys in class were all posting all this, you know, stuff. I just made a post about this, but yeah, it was like about the, like the 15% off and they were building the social media more and stuff like this. And it just kind of got too clicky and too popular for me and I'm like what's everybody hate and then they're like hating on the multiply and then I saw Steve was having a lot of fun with it and then of course you know we're sitting there talking shit to each other one day and I was like bro I'm gonna jump in these briefs and I'll squat your ass the first time I try and everything and then I kept messing with it jumped in the briefs and then um built my squat up pretty easy I'm like all right let me just try I'll put together a training cycle and then um I had deadlifted 800 uh, raw right before this. I put the briefs on and I had, I was doing, like at the end of a workout, I pulled 785 pretty damn easy. I'm like, this is good. My hips don't hurt. Gives me some compression. Uh, you yeah. know? And yeah. so that felt good. Then that tr- training cycle, I squatted 800 in the briefs. And then um, that kind of progressed. And then me and Steve had this in-gym rivalry. It was, it was the best thing we ever did for our squats because we were kind of, I don't even know where he was at, but we were, I was getting into the 800s and he was, 800, 900. 
we started our rivalry and we were talking shit. So every max effort day would go in, he'd chip me, I'd go in the next one and I'd chip him. And then we'd send it up and it started to get pretty damn heated. And so we basically just bypassed the entire 900s. It was like eight, 825, 850, 875, 900. He had a thousand, I had a thousand two, he had a thousand ten, I had a thousand twelve, or whatever <laughs> yeah, the heck it was. was history. Yeah. And then we just, we went from there and then I started to kind of get that thought in my head of like, don't do this thing that you always do now. Like you're very good at this. You got lucky and you found something that you're good at and you can use all of the things that you're good at and all the analytical skills. And I like the multiply stuff because it's a little bit more technical. It, well, I was just getting ready to say, and, and to all you fuckers out there listening to this interview right now that want to bag on geared lifting, try it fucking sometime. It's a whole different ball game. It's in a, it's in a, 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 a corner of its own because knowing oh, yeah. how to utilize that shit is I did it one time Ben I put a shirt on and I was a 530 raw bencher at the time I couldn't fucking I couldn't get up 500 to save my life oh it it's a nightmare difficult. the shirts are a nightmare I'm still yeah. dealing with that but yeah so it, it's I just hit on that real quick for a minute because we had talked about this in one of our podcasts where yeah. you're still a strong fucker. Oh, yeah. You take that gear off, you're still deadlifting seven, 800 pounds from the floor. Well, like I said, I, yeah. I had pulled 800 raw, and then it was it, for me, it was just a, like some of these guys, I don't even understand it. Like we talked about, the, the strongmen seem to get a lot out of the deadlift suit. A lot of these guys, you know, are pulling very similar numbers in the suit or without the suit, you know, and they might have to take it to cycle to acclimate their hips. But I mean, I just, I just, you know, I came back, I just pulled the suit off, and I just pulled 700 for five yeah. raw dead stuff. I just did that yesterday, or whatever it was, two, yeah, yesterday. Um, yeah, people like to think you put this on, all of a sudden you're Superman, but the reality is there's a lot of training build up to get Well, to and then on top of that, 90% of your training is raw base work anyway. You're right. doing, like, on my max effort shirt days, it's work up to a raw max, put a slingshot on, yeah. slingshot max, and then put the shirt on, acclimate your way up. And, um, yeah, you got to have a huge base. I mean, it's just, for me, it was just, you know, I'm a science guy and I'm a really analytical and research oriented type guy. And so for me, I'm like, all right, you know, I, I it gets very cool for me. I'm like, okay, I, how can I add this ply or add whatever and, and set that squat up, you know, because mm -hmm. like I, for me, I know, I don't know if it's genetics or what, but I always feel like I'm going to be behind that curve with those top guys. And the only way that I'm going to beat them is I'll think them. Yeah. You know, and so, so it provides an analytical point for me, but I mean, I mean, some of these, some of these guys, uh, you know, WPO level guys, their 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 benches are astronomical. I think it was like Matt Manuth used to warm up to like five hundred in the warm up room as a two forty two before he put a shirt on, you know. And then it's, yeah. it, I mean, it is what it is. But like, yeah, 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 that's why I like getting into it because I don't want anybody to understand. I want it to be my thing in this small community. <laughs> well, I don't care what anybody thinks yeah. about it. If they got something to say, send me your max deadlift, and I'm gonna rep that bitch. Yeah, I, I have no doubt you can give two shits what people think yeah. about it. I just think sometimes it, it 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 has this stigma attached to it, which isn't which isn't well, fair. And I know you don't care about that. That's not that's not something you even pay attention to. But I guess as a fan of the sport, fan of all lifting sports, is what I am. I don't discount that at all. And I think I've said it. Yeah, no, totally and neither do I. I I've, I've always considered myself a purist. I just barely started wearing knee sleeves in raw because I was like, raw is supposed to be raw, you know? And like, yeah. And like, that's just whatever. Um, and then I kind of like you, I put on knee sleeves one time. I was like, oh, my knees are warm and they don't hurt. Yeah, this is like, amazing. You know, they, and to be honest with you, I can take my knee sleeves off and do the same fucking thing. They really like whatever. But I, so I get it. Um, you know, I get like, I I used to kind of bag on gear lifting myself oh, too. You did. Yeah, yeah. A oh, while, dude. There was, I think but, it was three weeks before I jumped in the gear. I I I used to do my max effort work with the geared guys. Yeah. And I got a shirt printed that said "Raw is Law." On yeah, it. yeah. Like I used to just talk shit. It wasn't. I didn't. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. Talk shit. Yeah. Just get pissed off so we could have a better training session. But I yeah. talk. I talk. I talk shit just because I can. You know, it's like I, I was I, my my philosophy on that. So you're not going to whoop me. So what are you going to do about it? But <laughs> but like. And then, and then I watched like West Side versus the World, right? I'm, I've always been a West Side fan and stuff. And, and really, they kind of broke it down for me, I think, the best. And it's like, listen, like I've always been of the belief, for me personally, if I can't go out in the woods and do it, it doesn't count because I'm not going to put on a suit to pick that log up, right? Yeah. Or whatever. So that's my, that's my opinion. But then you talk to the, the West Side guys, and they're like, listen, I was never interested in being the strongest raw lifter. I want to be the strongest motherfucker to ever pick up a fucking weight on the planet. That, that's – it's – it's just a different that, that, mentality. It, That's it, all. It, like yeah. once you get in there, it's addicting, man. They yeah, call yeah. Them, like gear horse for a reason. Like you get there, and 
you get this obsession with with the geared numbers. The raw doesn't matter at all. Yeah, just getting I, as I just, big as it possibly can. Yeah, I I can go back raw and put in a couple of cycles and I'll do okay. But I could do the best and win some crazy me. I could give a fuck less because right. I don't want to. So do that's it. never crossed your mind. That you don't. Feel well, like it crossed right. my mind because I get so crazy when these people don't understand. Like like I I like going both like both ways with the strength training stuff. Like people don't understand these guys that are in the USAPL raw. These guys are fucking monsters, dude. Yeah. They would go. They would be a good strongman. They'd be a good gear yep. lifter. They'd be a good single yeah. ply guy. Yeah. The guys that are strong up are there strong. are going to be strong across yeah. the board. The guys that are whatever you know like and I don't care like okay. you know I'll dog on them whatever just. To talk some shit, but I know I respect them and I understand that these guys are monsters, you know. Yeah. They, it doesn't reciprocate the same way up to the multiplex because they think these guys Well, are, it does it does for me because I also know I can't I can't put on a suit and squat a thousand right, pounds. Bill, so there's a little it's, reciprocation. In all fairness, it does reciprocate. <laughs> it does reciprocate and these guys just have no idea. They they for me it was the adrenaline thing, like I told you. This took that adrenaline thing to the whole a whole nother level. When you got a weight on your back that can, that kill can you? literally kill you. <laughs> yeah. We've had guys, Brendan Lilly rolled like 832 off his back and blew everything that attached his knees outside of the skin apart. Like this stuff can kill you. Yep. I like that. Yep. Yep. It sounds a little crazy. No, but, but I, yeah. it's, for me, yeah. it's it's something that I just kind of got into it. Like that's why I'm, I'm doing the band shirt now and everybody hates that. I kind of like that about it, but it's just for me. You know, I know I'm getting older and I want to be able to lift heavy. And if it takes me a little assistance, I'm fine with that. I know that my peace of mind comes from what I do every day. It's going to come from the hard work that I put in. I go in there and I go balls to the wall every day. That's one of my biggest downfalls as a competitor because I'm more hardcore and I like training day in and day out more. That weekly grind for me is more appealing to me than setting it off on a platform. And I'm kind of trying to work through that. Yeah, I like the process too. Yeah, I'm the same way. Like, I I didn't start. I'm I'm 38. I I just now started powerlifting, so like, I I know I have a I have a limit physically um, to a point. But I'm also that guy that's kind of like you. Like, Joe laughs at me, and my coach laughs at me. Like, I, I have the mentality that I'm gonna I'm gonna pick it up, or I'm gonna rip my arms out of socket yeah. doing it. And that's in training. You know, that's before I even get on the platform. Well, so. some guy, you know, it's like, a, it's like a therapy <laughs> stuff. You know. Uh, like for a lot of guys and stuff. Yeah. That's a hundred percent true for me. That's I'd be in jail. It keeps me from killing people. Yeah. yeah I think that's mm-hmm. true for well a, a lot of people, right? What um you know, you, you started hitting these big numbers, you talk about like bypassing the nine hundreds in your squat to get to a thousand and, and you're you know, we watched you the other day in the I can't remember I think you had a thousand or pretty close to that. You were just fucking Yeah, around. that was a terrible idea. I had uh I got a little small tear in my hamstring on the deadlift before you guys came and then I was like, Well, Somebody's like, what are you doing? I was getting in my squat suit, and they're like, what are you, why are you squatting? I'm like, you don't need hamstrings to squat. And they just looked at me all weird, and then I just walked away and started squatting. <laughs> and then I was feeling good, and I wanted to load it up for you guys. And So, yeah, I, I, yeah, that was a thousand-pound duffalo bar squat. I got a little shaky on me, so I cut the fucker high. It pissed me off. But yeah, yeah That was a fun day. We, we saw some good lifts in there, and, and I, I told you, the one thing I take away from that is that pain under that bar. I mean, that, yeah. Fuck, it's, it's like a boiler ready to split every fucking rivet out of it. or everything. Oh, yeah. It's pretty crazy. So you got into your, uh, you're starting to hit these bigger numbers in as you become a more proficient geared lifter because you're figuring out kind of the the, the science behind it and the, the method behind yeah. using this, which I think is a, a conversation that we can get into for hours, I'm sure. But as you're starting to hit these numbers, where, what were some of the deficiencies that you found your that, that, to guys considering, you know, what were some of the problem areas that you were trying to decipher as you're becoming more proficient at lifting with using gear? Um, I, for me, it was kind of trying to figure out how to run an efficient training cycle and maintain all three lifts at the same time. Okay. So it was, if I squat real heavy and I tighten my upper back, my shoulders take a shit and I can't bench. Or if I lighten up the squat, bench goes good, but then the squat tanks, and then it's where do I fit the deadlift in? Do I pull heavy deadlifts after a max squat, or is that too much on the CNS? So part of, I had the strength to hit the numbers that I just hit maybe two, three years ago, maybe before my first meet, I believe. I know I had it in there, but I just couldn't put it all together. I didn't understand how to do it and um, how to choose the temps correctly and I mean, it's a whole timing issue. There's tightness with gear, and I was cutting some weight at the time, which, you know, was a bad idea. And 
all kinds of stuff. I mean, like any, anybody that does a multiply me will tell you, it's, it's just, if you're running a symphony out there, you got to hit it on the head. What about your, at that time when you're starting to really sort of make your way through the, the uh, you know, that, that the geared lifting power community, powerlifting community, who, who at that point was coaching you? I, I always coach myself usually. Okay. So you just surrounded yourself with good input. Uh, yeah, I just, I just research and research and research. And then, um, one of my, my, what I would say my biggest strengths is as a strength coach is kind of looking at a sport, you know, and the physical demands of that and kind of breaking down the energy systems and figuring out why do we need this in here for this to build this up and go in each area. And then of course, obviously it was, you know, just, I, I followed a very traditional West side system and then I kind of just put my spin on it as I needed. So the place, everything was already in place. There was guys that were doing it for years. Kind of Steve was a conjugate guy. So we engineered up some, um, some Monday night max effort squats and I'll roll those into some speed waves. And then, um, I had no idea what I was doing in the shirt. I hired in a couple of guys to help with the shirt. Yeah. Um, and then kind of full circle powerlifting type thing. So Tim Hensley, um, wanted to come out of retirement. He had been uh, on the sidelines for two years and I don't know who referred him over to me. Um, but me and him hit it off instantaneously. We we're uh, real good buddies now. And I was like, Hey, you know, I had, you know, I was a thousand uh, plus pound squatter. I was our deadlifting over eight. Um, and I was like, Hey, why don't we just trade up here? And he was 804 natural multiply bencher at just 200 pounds or 198, like all time world record bencher. So he's like, yeah, I'll run your bench for you. And then I'll run his, you know, I ran his squat and his deadlift. Yeah. And then we both just started, started flying. Where, where, where's your, I, I didn't ask you this. I don't think I've ever asked you. Uh, where is your, where's your bench at right now? So this morning I did 900. So I hit that. And this was uh, one of those light bulb days. Figured out the shirt, figured yeah. out how to uh, bench that. That was in my unlimited shirt. I just benched. This is what the bench frustrates me. The only shirt that I can use that doesn't, shut my shoulder off for eight, nine days with inflammation was a uh, Inzer 60, which is like, uh, you know, a 300 to 308 size shirt, but the chest plate's real big. So you can kind of set your arms right. incorrect. So I use that and just pinch the sleeves up and I hit 611 at that last meet, but I got like a correct size shirt. Um, the cycle before that, you know, when I was ripping, you know, 750 off of one it's board or two amazing. board in that shirt, yeah. like, thinking I was going to have over an 800 pound bench. And then, um, it was just too tight. So I couldn't touch it. So I get to a one board and drift like four or five inches down the stomach. It sounds strange, but all the guys that wear shirts would understand what I'm talking about. It was just, it was awesome off the boards. I just couldn't touch it. Yeah. And then I started to figure out, all right, I got to get into some custom sizing and then ordered a custom shirt came in. I don't know if I messed up or they messed up thing didn't fit, but they always laugh at me. Cause I'm like, Seven thousand dollars in the hole for bench shirts. I have <laughs> you nine own them all. brand new shirts. <laughs> trying to figure out something that just yeah. doesn't. Yeah. Literally, I'm talking. I can't even raise my arm up yeah. until you know. I got to a point where I was putting on a bow tie trying to get under, you know, a Mars bar mm. and a camber bar, and I'm like, all right, this isn't going to do anything for my longevity. And I'm very. That's one of my. Well, I don't know if it's a good thing, but yeah, I'm very good at figuring out where that red line is and just staying just below it or riding the red line without right. actually blowing yeah. something up. Right. And I got to the point where I'm like, all right, if I know that my shoulder's feeling like this and I feel like I'm about to blow something out, it's going to really go. So I I do, however, I have to do the, um, I have to do the regular poly shirt for, um, for the WPO. Luckily right now, I mean, there's guys that I'm, I'm stronger than raw that are benching 750 in these damn shirts. I just can't figure it out. But luckily, my squat and my pull puts me up there or whatever. Um, so I, I like what do. you said about it's a symphony. And, man, it's got to come together, doesn't it? That's I mean, what it is. Oh, man. It's got to be the – I mean, I've seen guys lose it the last two weeks. They get in a fight with the old lady. Mm. And all of a sudden, they're just mentally checked out. And meat goes down the shitter. Yeah. Cut weight wrong, whatever. They just have a bad – whatever some negativity going on in the mind terrible meat you hit a number and you might not and you don't sniff it again for two months because oh just, yeah my deadlift now is back on within 25 pounds where my deadlift was at three years ago yeah just got back now mm. 
So there's always something to hang your hat on. There's always something to get excited about. The problem is there's there's also something that there, there's always something yeah. to drive me yeah. on the brink of psychopathy about. That's <laughs> how I would word it a little better than okay. that. Yeah. Because yeah. so I'm in there yeah. just connecting yarn. Thing. You got you, you know, got to look at the map with the drawn map, trying to figure <laughs> out how the hell do I get this deadlift back? How do I fix this damn bench? Yeah. You know whatever. But we got blessed uh, with a lot of the guys coming in through the gym. We had you know, as I got going, um, Steve ended up winning the squat battle. He started shooting his squat way up, and then um, we had a bunch of guys coming up on my heels. There started getting me motivated again. We had our guy Jim that uh, we did our send off party. He came in and. Year and some change in or something. He squatted like 1060. And then we had um, a WPO guy, Kyle Dussel. He came up from Main Street Barbell in Ohio. And um, he was one of my biggest, he's probably the biggest influence on the game day plan of figuring out your numbers based on how you feel and how how to go off of what you hit during the uh, prep and all that stuff. So, I mean, and then we had Steve, you know, there who's done a million in one multiply meets. He got coached by the trigger warning, Anthony Oliveira. And, um, we had, we got a guy, Mike Suderic. He used to train with Dave Tate down there. He's a multiply guy. He used to write columns and stuff. I believe it was like business stuff for Elite FTS. And we had all these guys, and then we had Tim and um, Hensley, and we had all these guys that had this huge base of knowledge. And like I said, like I, I, I'm, a, I'm very, very good at like, I'll sit there and I'll talk to Tim about his bench. And I'll figure out things that he's trying to communicate to me that he doesn't even know that he's trying to communicate to me or he can't even do it. Right, right. Whatever with words. Right, right. So I start figuring out, I'm like, oh, you want me to do this with what you're doing? You just never told me. And then I figured out I can put it into place myself. So I did that with all these guys. And a lot of the guys in that community are so awesome. It's very similar to the strongman community. You can you can call up or uh, message one of these really high-level geared guys and they'll chat with you for hours. And uh, the guy who makes my uh, bench shirt, the unlimited one, Rob Fro. Benched a thousand at one ninety eight in this thing, but he makes the shirts. And I reached out to him a couple of times, just asked him, "Hey, this is my training cycle. Take a look. Tell me what I need to drop, or tell me what I should do different." And these guys will, these guys will kill. So you know, I asked you. I said, "Well, who? You, I know you write. You do your own your own programming. So you've got a great team of of minds around you." Oh, it's always bouncing yeah. stuff off. Yeah. I mean, we got you know real high level coaches, Jim Surratt, um, who was there. We were doing the send off. I got. My training uh, partner, um, um, Brent, and um, we got kind of our mobility guy, uh, Coach B. Rose and Nate. They're like the FRC, I don't even know what the it's called, regular FRC, and then there's like the manual. All that stuff, we kind of use it, and then I have a really good chiropractor that me and all my athletes see, and we, we talked with her about activation and all this crazy stuff on the CNS. So I try to put that all together. I did have some, you know, um, like I was working with Andrew Clayton, during the strongman days, me and him had a um, pretty good relationship uh, uh, through online, uh, just DMing and stuff. And I always try to keep up with what he's doing and stuff. I really hope he does a comeback at strongman. But he was one of the guys that I realized that sometimes the science, the, the, you can't put a 400 pound log over your head that's not anywhere in a science book. You can't put a thousand pounds in your back. Right. There, no one's ever going to teach you that in a science book. Right. He was one of those guys. He just started doing it when he was a small little fat guy. And he just knew so many things just from being in the game for that long. And I knew the science on the other side of strongman, but he just, you know, he set off a lot of stuff um, in the right direction for the strongman training that I use myself and that I use for my athletes now. It's amazing how much information is out there. You know, we started the conversation with uh, how these young guys are coming up and the resource that's available to them that wasn't available to maybe a guy like you or me when we first started, uh, it, it is just amazing. So it's going to be interesting to see the direction these the next generation. Yeah, yeah. That really well, that's what's so and, and exactly like you guys were talking about. Like you, you feel like the ceiling's there, and then it's you get some of these guys that are coming up. It's so crazy right now. I got a guy who went from I think it was six hundred to a thousand pound deadlift in a year and a half of training. Yeah, and he's about to do static monsters. He's looking to break uh, my guy Matt Kehoe. He's looking to break. Jay Pritchett's all-time 18-inch. I can't um, wait for that show. Actually, Axel uh, record at uh, he's doing it at BYT. Yeah. Um, and then I got you know I got uh, that big guy uh, Logan Money, and he put 500 over his head on a football bar. The kid is already um, clean and pressed uh, 470 on an axle, pretty damn easy. And he's an amateur. And I'm like, if we if we just got this guy an invite to Giants Live, we trained overhead for a year, he'll break the all-time world record. But he wants to get his pro card. They want to do it right. They, they I, I sell these guys on the big picture. 
They come and I say, we're not training for this next show. I give a fuck less. Like, yes. We want progress, but I want to set up your deadlift and your log and your GPP and your hamstrings. I want to set all this up for when you become a pro. That's how we have to do it. So luckily, I don't know what it is, but I guess I might be a good salesman because they uh, well, they, they get in there and they stick with me. Well, you might be. Listen, anybody that wouldn't want to follow your intensity, I, they'd have to be crazy or just not ready to put their 100% into the game. They're scared of you. But, you know, <laughs> it, you, said, you actually just hit I'm on my, nice, next, my next note I was going to mention or, or talk to you with about because when we were hanging out at RPG that one Saturday – you had said exactly the same thing to me in a different way. You said, listen, I don't want to train somebody for their next competition. I want to train somebody for the next four years like I'm getting them ready for the Olympics. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's, that's the hardest part with a lot of these people is um, I almost have to do a bait and switch on them sometimes. I got to be like, yeah, man, we're going to pump that you know, deadlift through the roof, whatever, for the next meet. Get them roped in and then I can kind of get my claws in them and then yeah. get them to understand we have to change – this deadlift and it's going to go backwards for a couple months before we make that progress. But we have, we, you're never going to pull that number in your head. That's 300 pounds heavier than what you're pulling now without making these technical adjustments. Yeah. So that's the hardest part is getting these guys to buy in long term, And then I get this, my, my biggest weakness, I think as a coach, I like these guys don't have this same crazy clock and this urgency and this want to like, do the best that they can possibly do with their time. They don't have that like me. And so I have to try to sift through that or they might, and I, I can't figure out how to get to that. And so that's kind of the constant challenge. So sometimes I ride these guys too hard and I, I text them in the middle of the night and I'm like, where the fuck were you at today during training? And they give me some BS thing. And I'm like, you know, sometimes I just look at them like, man, it's a hobby. Why are you freaking out about this stuff? But it's the same guys that say, hey, coach, can I come sit down in your office with you? And they come talk to me on a Sunday, and they tell me how hardcore they are. And then they get to year three when it starts to get hard, and I call the swamp. You know, that's where they get to. They get to there, and you got to – it's like the old uh, never-ending story, man. you got to leave the horse in the swamp. you got to tread it on foot. Yeah. But when you come out of the other side, you're going to be a lot closer than you ever thought you would be. You could do something – that you never thought you could do. And so I tell these guys, you know, you start looking at these guys from where I was at when I started. You look at these guys online, you know, or you look at these guys in Powerlifting Magazine or I'm the World's Strongest Man, and you, you think that they're made of something different because they're so strong. You're like, this guy's a freak. I wish I could be a freak and stuff. And then I tell these guys, now I go, you can. We can do it. This is something you can learn. And that's why I'm huge into the mental side of stuff because a lot of people are just weak in between the ears. And I tell them, this is something you can learn. I learned it. Yeah, I, I love that, Ben. I mean, that 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 really is uh, couldn't be said any better. It really can't be. You're not looking at guys that are built to something different. It's yeah. blood and bones, like everybody else. Yeah, and that yeah. And, and it, that's some of the hardest things is, you know, when we get guys that start to slowly make it up there, but they still see these guys as like a level of. They still see them like a god. They yeah. see them like a level above. And I say, I go, you have to get this out of your head. You have to. It's kind of the kill your idols type thing. You have to get these guys out of your head and understand that they're your peer. You are competing with these guys now. You can respect them. Sure. Like some, like that was my hardest part is when I made WPO. I'm like talking to the guys. I'm talking to my wife. I'm like, I'm supposed to be like hardcore crazy man when I'm in there, but I'm gonna be like walking up, like shaking people's hands, like, "Hey man, can I get an autograph and all this stuff?" And even though it's powerlifting, whatever. But yeah, I, yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I look at yeah, it just yeah. like yeah. that's like the NBA, NFL for me, you know. Yeah. And that's just whatever. It's. It's kind of a corny thing, whatever, I, I but I, I just, yeah. I was trying to figure out how do I navigate that? I'm like, am I going to walk up to like Dave Hoff and be like, hey, bro, can I get a picture with you? <laughs> Hope you do good on your next attempt. Then I got to go out and fucking squat yeah. 10 guys before him or some shit, you know? So but that's a part of it too, right? I mean, you're enjoying the process. Oh, right? I love you it. You know, guy and you get to meet all these guys that you've been looking at for years saying, I'm, I can't wait to get to that level. You finally get there. Of course, you're going to get pictures taken with them and, and maybe have them sign something. Who knows, right? I mean, it's a part of that process that makes this fun for you. That, oh, that, yeah. that was the most fun thing. And then everybody's like, no, man, you got to be, you know, hard-nosed and all that stuff. And I'm like, and then finally I sat there, I'm like, I don't, none of, I don't care about any of that. And that's kind of like yeah. my philosophy behind this whole thing with, you know, you get these guys that are posting this stuff. They're like, oh, man, you know, there's no more competition these days. I miss the days when everybody was like fighting in the warm-up room and all that stuff. And like 99% of these lifters – they get in their own way. That is what I did my entire time. For whatever reason, this you know this last meet, huge breakout meet for me was my first WPO total, and I just got out of my own fucking way. I just stopped worrying about these other guys, stopped competing with all these other guys because I always left that two, three hundred pounds in the tank, 
And it wasn't because of anything other than me fucking up my own training. Yeah. So I tell everybody, focus on you. This is an individual sport. Mm -hmm. That guy hitting that next PR that you're chasing is never going to do anything to your training. Okay. It's all 100% you. Get healthy. Get smart. Get motivated. Get this straight between your ears. And then you will do the things that you're supposed to do. What was that total? 20. They fucked it up when they put in the record book. Drives me nuts. But <laughs> 20. It was 20. Uh, 436. 2436. Yeah, I, I had to cut the second squat. Well, my buddy Kyle was like, cut the second squat because you're terrible when you take three squats. I'm like, God damn it. But cooked a 1025 and then our big goal between me and Steve, we wanna we're gonna break the uh all time Michigan squat records like 1067. So I was gonna go 1070 and then we decided let's I don't care about that. Let's save it for the deadlift, get three poles in. Yeah. What, uh, what's coming up for you? I'm, you had mentioned you had sort of a, a little bit of an injury sort of snafu. It was an injury, then all of a sudden it was an injury. You pulled out of the show that was coming up, right? Yeah, I pulled out of the WPO. So I qualified, usually qualify a year in, in advance. So I qualified for next year's WPO. They had some shortages on com competitors from Corona. They had, you know, um, some dropouts because people weren't training. Which normally I'd be like, I don't want to weasel my way in there. But when they did the rankings, you know, I had jumped up in the gloss burner so high that I was like, all right, I can, I can at least feel good about them asking me to do it because it wasn't like I weaseled into the last spot because 10 people dropped out. Like, you know, I was well above the 600 mark. So, you know, I was in the top top 20 heat. There's, you know, whatever, mm -hmm. 12 or 13 guys behind me. Um, But yeah, so... I had came off of uh, the Wolverine Open when I hit my qualifier, and then it was I think it was like a six week turnaround. So kept training, and apparently the body doesn't like squatting a thousand pounds, pulling eight hundred pounds like six weeks in a row. So then my no, knees, I'm... my knees blew up like yeah. I, I popped a. I said my knees feeling funky. Wrapped up to do my Circumax three weeks out from what would have been the WPO. Popped my knee wrap off, and um, my knee swelled up like a damn grapefruit. And then I was trying to walk on the left leg and then I kind of twisted and twinged and it felt like I blew my damn meniscus out. I'm like, oh no, here we go. And um, so I had a bunch of people look at it. They said uh, popliteus muscle, a little muscle that controls your tibial torsion mm -hmm. of the lower leg was inflamed and it was kind of inflaming my meniscus and minimizing the joint space. And then because I was trying to hinge at the knee it joint, like it, yeah. it was just filling with fluid. Mm -hmm. But it, it was it was so stupid because I've I've... I've done some crazy shit through some injuries across, you know, the years. I, I got a hernia and came back and squatted 800 pounds four weeks uh, after that. And all kinds of stuff like that. Went three for three at a meet with a torn pack somehow. I have no idea. Like benching. And this one was just fluid on the knee. And I'm like, what the hell is going on? And then um, we had already changed our summer vacation, canceled that, everything. Like um, all that. So, yeah, I had to drop out of that really annoyed me, but then what made it even worse was the week of the WPO, we finally figured out that my quads stopped activating and it was causing the instability issues yeah. in the knee. Mm. I was getting too hip dominant in all my movements and I wasn't really driving with my legs. So we put a TENS unit, fired up the quads. I uh, had a couple people reach out to me and help me with some knee um, rehab protocols and we got the quads activating and I did two workouts. One was a light one, like just fitness workout and then one was a powerlifting workout and because the quads activated the swelling just completely cleared wow, up in cool. like two days <laughs> wow and then i was like well i'm still peaked so i'm gonna send some numbers up so then the week after i hit 900 for a triple in my briefs and then i did it i don't know i did something with the deadlift but yeah so i was i was peaked but it was a week or something after that so um yeah, so, that, so I'm qualified for the next year WPO. So semis would be in March, and then the finals would be again in August. Um, I'm still trying to figure out how I want to go about it. Um, I'm really into this band shirt thing because everybody hates it. They call it cheating, so I like being the villain. So I like going there, and you can lift more weight. Yeah. And so um, I'm going to do a meet at our gym. It's called the uh, Winter Warfare. We do it every year. It's a UPA meet. But I can compete in the unlimited category with my band shirt and do a full power. And when is that? That is usually second weekend in January or whatever it is, like okay. the 14th, yeah. 16th, something like that. But um, So that'll be an unlimited total. My goal for that would be to bench something big. I'd like to bench between 900 and 1,000. Um, I got Rob Farrell engineering me up a new uh, shirt. Okay. 
We're going to try to make a move on at least 900. I'd like to say YOLO it and just, <laughs> yeah. just, just say I held it for one time at least. Just say you unwrapped it. Like, I unwrapped it, bro. It was there. I swear it was there. Um, but um, I would like to get you know something like that on the books and then maybe get invited and start doing some of the metal militia scene. Yeah. I yeah. like those guys a lot. I like their meats. Yeah. They're offering cash. and yeah, It's like these old school meats where they're not, you know, they got – and heavy metal going on they got strobe lights and all this I've heard a lot of stuff cool man i'm like meats, man. this yeah. is what i i keep telling these guys you know i keep telling steve i'm like we need to get like a heavy metal band and you know just fucking turn this play, make it look like halloween in here and just scare these people man i want them to be scared when we walk out of the back have some walk out music and turn it into like the wwf man i'm like you know that's kind of means <laughs> like, machine listen, fucking. i don't know steve that well but the 10 minute conversation i have with him i can just hear him right now going come on man come on oh <laughs> yo, yeah that's that's his favorite line oh come on man yeah so yeah, yeah but that's true. why well, that's why we got a great relationship. Yeah, well, listen, our, like RPG solid. and the Rochester Performance Gym, we're talking about it, and we'll make sure we, well, we'll never quit mentioning RPG. I, as far as I'm concerned, it, along with Strength Depot, and, we're pretty damn lucky to have Bro, so we have some fantastic gyms. Awesome training facilities around us. But, Amazing. Uh, you know, I, I want to get on to one more topic real quick because I, I never want to leave this out, man. You, you're a father. I saw yes, you sir. walking your your little guy. You, uh, is his name Ben? Yeah, his name's Ben. He's the fourth. Yeah. Benjamin. Wow. James, oh, okay. The yeah. Yep. How old is he? Six months old or something? About to be six months. Yeah. Yep. I saw you walking him in that video the other day. Yep. Yep. Um, and your wife, what's her name? Melanie. Melanie. That's right. Yeah, and that's only one. We well, got just the one. Yep, just the one. We want to have a couple more, but yeah. See when that goes down. I don't know. Well, that's I'm getting old. I don't want to be 100 when the kids in high school. Bro, I, my I kids you. are almost out of school, thank God. Well, I saw you practicing. Your, I mentioned that mention you had your little Ben and his, and his little bouncer, and you were practicing your reloading the other day on your, your video. Oh, had yeah. some fun with that. But anyhow, uh, how supportive is Melanie? I, she's got – I mean, I, well, that's a stupid question. It's stupid. Yeah. Uh, we know how supportive she is. She it's, deals with you every I mean, day. I, it, yeah. it's – I mean, first of all, she has to deal with the insanity of somebody with the mind like me. It's so scattered and it's so lasered into one thing and then it's scattered and lasered into the next thing. So it just drives her nuts. And um, But I mean, just with powerlifting, you know, it's a selfish sport. You know, and I told her she, well, like, as you guys know now, I get intense and she will ask me, like, how far do you want to go? And I, or what would you sacrifice? And you know, I, I told her a, a long time ago, you get to that crossroad where you have to sell your soul to the devil when you make it to where I'm going to go. And I told her there's nothing that I wouldn't sacrifice. I told her that if I end up in a wheelchair, it is what it is. I can shut it down and be at peace with myself knowing that I did everything that I could to try to get there. Yeah. And I'm okay with that. And I already knew that that was going to be the cost. I already know that my knees are already shot, my hips are already shot and everything like that. And I'm going to have to do a lot of stuff to stay mobile, yeah. even in my 40s. And it is what it is. But I mean, she's and it's insane, man. She's a rock. She she wakes up at, she works at 10 a.m., you know, and she wakes up at 5 o'clock, gets the baby packed, and she'll show up to stretch my hips out before a damn bench. Yeah. And she, me and her have traveled the meets, you know, just me and her. And she takes my verbal abuse while she's tightening up my gear. And I'm like my fucking quads going now I'm loosening the shit and I'm yelling at her and then she's yelling back at me. She wraps, she's wrapped my knees for multiple 900,000 pound squats. I mean, um, she's awesome. I couldn't even imagine it without her, but she's, she's the rock man. Yeah, ben, you ever see that? You saw the movie Tin Cup, right? Like yeah. I, I don't remember much of it. She's at, she's at, at the end of the movie. She's your, uh, she's your one just saying, just go for it, Ben. Just go. Well, for that it. was what, you know, it was one of these things kind of brought me some tears at the time. Cause we have, we're huge Harry Potter fans. We've got the kids' rooms all Harry Pottered out. And she's just insane. She just watches this stuff on repeat, the whole thing. And so, you know, we have postponed this Harry Potter world trip down in Florida already three years. And then going into the WPO, and, you know, I was like, what, uh, I'm like, yeah, they invited me to WPO. That's pretty cool or whatever. I'm like, I, I'm not going to do it because it's too close to the Harry Potter trip. It's one week after and then she kind of just like got to attention and got like real serious with me for a minute, which, you know, she doesn't get serious with me, like in terms of like the real talking about the powerlifting and stuff. And she's like, listen, you don't know what the hell's going to happen. She's like, you've been working for this. It's a lifetime dream. And she's like, Harry Potter world's always going to be there. And we don't know if you're going to blow a hip out. You might get another hernia, whatever, you know, you're going to blow some up. And there's not a lot of guys that could ever say that they got there. So we, you need to go do this. 
And that was a real powerful moment for the relationship because I knew that she was bought into the whole end goal. She still gets on me. She's like, yeah, you got till you're 37. And then yeah, I'm yeah. like, okay with that. I'm like, I got, I, I get there sure. by 37, sure. hopefully. Yeah. But I know when I get there in 37, I'm like, Masters Records, man. Let's <laughs> smash all that. Let's go. Yeah. Yeah. I got Am I not? Am I not? I'm like 38. I'm like, I got two years to Masters. I'm going to fuck some people That's up. What, <laughs> like, the goal that I keep telling uh, with my straw man guys is like, yeah. I'd like to finish out the powerlifting career and take some of the records down that I want to take and do what I can do. And then I'd like to jump back in and do some Masters Strongman. That'd be fun. Because I... I There's still a love there, isn't there? No, it, I mean, yeah. that, I, I actually, I mean, this is going to sound terrible, but I enjoy it more than anything I'm doing with powerlifting. Yeah. I've always enjoyed Strongman. So every time we have a program, I look and I'm like, we're going to sneak in some overhead. I'll throw we're going to throw in a log press. We're going to throw in some stones. <laughs> yeah, I'll throw it there yeah. that day. Because that one, well, it's one of those things. I, I look back at it and I'm like, I didn't realize where I was at with it. And I look back now, and I'm, we're, we're starting to see these, you know, the middleweights come up through uh, mm-hmm. Anthony Furman stuff. And I'm like, man, I was way closer yeah. than I would. If I would have put in three more years there, I would have been right up there with those guys. And, I mean, they're just to, – to me, those are the best athletes in the world, those middleweight guys. We, uh, we uh, agree, yep. actually. We yep. totally agree with that. I was, we were having this conversation again the other day. Mirrored exactly that, what you just said. Well, I think all things happen for a reason, Ben. Listen. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think that, I think you got the right plan. I, I I can't wait to see you in Master Strongman when you get there or whenever you get there because I know you will. Uh, but you got a lot of work to do yet in, in your powerlifting endeavors, and I know you're going to get them done. Um, I, I just want to say thank you so much for coming out and spending this time with us. Uh, this has been a – well, I, listen, we've been waiting for a long time, and, and your reputation precedes you. You're an intense thank guy. Thank you, man. But let's be clear. You're an intense guy. With with all this all this uh, prelude to who you are at, with everybody we talk to that loves Harry Potter, so yeah. never forget about that. <laughs> I do. I wish there was uh, you know I wish they put a pistol in their hand instead of a wand. But yeah, right. Listen, a whole different he, movie. No, I think that's a perfect uh, representation of who you are because I've got to know you pretty well now, and, and you, man, you are a guy that's multifaceted in every dimension in your life. And uh, and thank you again for joining the Gym Life podcast. No, thank you guys. For we're gonna sure. we're gonna keep following up because we'll be at RPG occasionally. We're gonna come to that meet in January. I'll talk to Steve about that as well. And uh, in the meantime, man, best of luck with everything. And uh, thanks again for being here with us. Thank you guys. Appreciate it, man. Have a good one, everybody.